Passengers, all passengers, put your seats into the upright position, secure your tray tables, and please put your brains onto rock and roll mode. Uh, this is Captain Speaking. Captain, uh, it's not just Captain Speaking. I've only ever been on a plane once, and the captain didn't even like talk back to didn't us. Didn't even like come that. and give you a pin. Or no, anything. nothing. So I don't know if that actually happens, but it's what it is. Welcome back. I am Omen Say, and I am Nick McGill. Together we are Feckless Moans, and this is Talk Tall to Me, a sweaty mad dash through the airport terminal of Prague Rock, in which non-scheduled service Nick and obstacle-free zone Omen. We'll flight test every single song that TSA-approved rock band Jethro Tull has ever released. We will approve the landing approach of Martin Rotating Beacon Bar, confirm the horizontal and vertical axes of David Precision Instrument Peg, and perform a full mechanical inspection of Mark Conical Surface Craney. This will be an on-time arrival once we are at a cruising altitude of 56,000 feet, we should be able to make up the time it is taking to perform the de-icing procedures on Ian Airspace Anderson. So sit back, relax, and thank you for flying Feckless Moms Airlines. The skies are our thighs. Oh, the thighs the limit. <laughs> Nick, hello. Hello, Omen. Hello. How are you? I have made it through another week, Nick. How are oh, you? Oh my gosh, I barely made it through mine. It was a rough one. You got your foot stuck in the door this week. Uh, getting out or... or Getting out of the week. Yes, absolutely, yeah. I, 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 by Wednesday, I, was, I thought it was Friday. And right now, I still can't believe that it's finally Friday. <laughs> what if I told you it's no! not? Oh, permanent Wednesday. Woof. In, in the ears of our listeners, it is Tuesday. That is correct. People only listen to this podcast on Tuesdays. Speaking of the podcast. Oh, yeah. Nick, we're doing a podcast. Should we talk tall? I think we ought to. Sure. Sure. Let's talk tall. Before we talk tall official, let's uh, let's talk tall with a new writer in her. What is OMG. Mary, if you don't mind. Thank you so much, Mary. Oh, Mary, you're looking so well. You're just like. Glowing, you seem really, really happy. Ah, thank you, Master Seed. I've started therapy. Oh, that's so you know, great. That's wonderful. I really just think you know we all we all have so much to work through. It's been such a tough couple of years, and you know anything you can do to get your your mind to be in a healthy place. I don't know what you're talking about. I started therapy to make my legs the same length. <gasps> oh, physical therapy. Oh, I'm physical so- therapy. Okay, <laughs> the leg stretching one. Yeah. Okay. I mean, well, whatever works for yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, it seems to be doing the job. She seems pretty good, so. I'll saunter off now. Oh, look at the sway in those hips, Omen. Still going in a bit of a circle, but you're, you're getting there. <laughs> a little hitch in the giddy up. <laughs> Nick, we, I was handed an email here. That you were. Printed out from the old Feckless Moms Apple IIe. That's right. It took four hours. <laughs> Just four hours of... <laughs> This this email comes to us from Andy D. Andy D. Hello, Andy D. Andy D. The subject line is, I'm probably living in the past, but on Queen and Country from Warchild, dot, 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 message. I've only recently discovered the blog slash podcasts, and I'm greatly enjoying catching up. I was listening to the episode on Queen and Country a few days ago, and I think there's an aspect of interpretation you've missed. These might only occur to a Brit who was around, albeit young, at the time. I think Ian's motivation was a bit more complex than just the anti-colonialism that you attribute it to. Take another look at the lyrics, then remember this was penned about the same time that the band had only just aborted moving to Switzerland to avoid the then penal states of UK taxation. The wind is on the river and the tide has turned too late, so we're sailing for another shore where some other ladies wait. Could well be referencing the plan to leave. 
And it's been this way for five long years since we signed our souls away. We bring back gold and ivory, rings of diamonds, strings of pearls, make presents to the government so they can have their social whirl. This would be about five years since they started to sell well, and they were being asked to make a present of 86% of their earnings yeah. to Her Majesty's government. Also at that point, both our major political parties were heavily inclined toward social spending. In 74, the Labour Party came to power and started a series of economic disasters that led to us having to get a bailout from the IMF. Oh, I didn't actually realize that. Here's the key point, though. They build schools, they build factories with the spoils of battles won, and we remain their pretty sailor boys. Hold our heads up to the gun. The government of the early imperial era, say, of Nelson's era, certainly wouldn't have been building factories. That was entirely the business of the private sector. In 73, though, whole swaths of our economy were nationalized. Mm. From coal mining, to power generation, to manufacturing cars, steels, and even a brewery! <laughs> These were usually very poorly run, hovering on the edge of bankruptcy and requiring frequent bailouts. Similarly, the state only picked up responsibility for education in the 1870s or so. Huh. And even then, not the central government. I think Ian was using the song to draw an analogy between the exploited sailors of the early imperial years and the band being exploited by the government, the figurative gun being held to their heads to get money the government needed. Sure. Does this submission look like spam? Yeah. Report it here. You don't have to say that. You do that every time. Thank you so much, Andy D. That's really a, a very well articulated point. Super insightful, yeah. I think that, you know, I hope that you will find our, our analyses getting a bit more toothy as we go on. Yeah. But but that's something that, you know, again, we have said many times and we will say it again. We're terrible. <laughs> I was going to say, we're, we're not actually Brits. And so having that perspective really is super helpful. Yeah. Yeah. In addition. And it does make a lot of sense. It, I do. I, I think you, you bring up a good point is it's thinking all the way back to War Child. That that was a really long time ago in our our growth and progression as Tolkienologists. And I'd yeah. like to think that we get a little more in-depth here. But that being said, this is one of those prime instances of kind of that cultural oceanic divide. On top of that, like generational too. Like it was uh, it was of, a, of a, an era that we were not privy to. So a, a lot of these kind of it's this perfect storm of us just being like, I don't know. And then someone like you chiming in with a very, very erudite and pithy, pithy and logical explanation to it. Also, 86% of their earnings. Woof, my goodness. Yeah, I, I know we've talked that in the past. Yes. But every time we bring it up, it, it's just... I, I always forget the numbers, you know, but like every time it's brought up, it's it's a shock. Well, yeah. 86, like ours takes what, 20, 30% tops and, and well, and if you're, and if you're wealthy, it takes 10, aught point five, zero yeah. two percent yeah. Oh, that's how it works. Yeah. That makes total sense. Yeah. Thank you so much, Andy D for writing in. Thank you for being a first time writer in her. Your fresh ink is appreciated. Your fresh ink is a, a heady <gasps> incense in the temple of talk tell to me. I could I could see you working that. I saw it workshopped in real time. It was uh there was a strike in my brain. Yeah, no, I saw it happen. Somebody somebody fled. <laughs> Nick, what else do we have before we jump into the song? Well, I think we should talk a little more A. And today we are going to talk about the fact that this is we're, we're t we've got a little kind of potpourri of facts today. This is a little a little miscellany pieces here. So I, I've got the fact that this is the first album in several years, many years, I would say at this point that it's really it's just a bunch of collected songs on an album, not working toward a centralized theme. Mm. You know, it's got an '80s theme, kind of maybe I don't know. But it's not like Storm Stormwatch. It's not like Songs from the Wood. I mean, we could even go further back into Too Old to Rock and Roll. You know, those were all thematic and we could go into Thick as a Brick. 
You know, everything was was its own central idea held within an album. And this is finally, this is an album of these songs that all sound similar, but do not work to a greater thesis. Hmm. In addition, the title A obviously is A for Anderson. It was going to be his first solo album. We get it. So there's an apocryphal story that uh, on the official Tall site, that it says that it was named a just because when they were when they had like the master tapes and they had them in their cases and they had to label them yeah someone just just chucked an a on there so then they were like when they when they finally collected them they're like oh well that's a great name for it like no i mean it was meant to be anderson all along it was meant to be a sure sure this is an album that ian places so i, I don't I've heard in several interviews that Ian, like he kind of breaks the albums into three tiers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And th- I remember hearing this that. is one that Ian places at the top of tier three. I'm very curious to know what what falls below it, but this is clearly not terribly high on on Ian's personal the, charts. The third tier down, the whole yeah, album does it. Yeah. I wonder if I wonder if his uh, experience with it was tainted by. Having it, having his hand forced to have it released as a tall album rather than a solo album. I'm sure there was a lot to do with that in the sense of kind of probably for the first time in a long time, he kind of had some semblance of, of creative control rested away from him here. You know, maybe. That's interesting because, I mean, he clearly had control over the songs themselves. Right, right. I, interesting. Interesting to, to hear that, you know, and... Maybe maybe someday we'll get to ask the man himself. Someday. Someday. And then finally, uh, the last thing that I have that's gonna gonna you're gonna piggyback onto is let's talk about Eddie Jobson a little bit here. Let's do He is the the guest violinist, electric violinist, and he was so adamant on being considered a guest. He was not a part of the band. He was not a session musician. Like he, he was so, so severely serious about being a guest. He only agreed to doing a part of the tour. And, and he, he wanted to, by being called a guest, he could maintain or, or further the idea of him being a solo artist. Because I don't think he was, mm. prior to this, I don't think he was solo. He was just about to break out into doing his own solo thing. So special, like, guest star solo artist, Eddie Jobson. That helped kind of fuel that narrative. Yeah, exactly. And we should say that Jobson was not only the violinist, but also the synthesizer. Sure. Player. Right, right. The synthesizer. The syn- synthesis. So we haven't heard from this for, for a while, but I do have a little a couple of snippets from the book A Passion Play, The Story of Ian Anderson and Jethro Tull by Brian Raby. So Raby says, Eddie Jobson was only available to answer questions from me via email. Jobson, let me try to give you a quick overview of what my position in the band was at the time. First of all, I was never a member of Tom. <laughs> Ian called me in 1980 and asked if I would like to collaborate with him on a solo album. Mm. I was just beginning my own solo album, The Green Album, at the Ooh. time, but agreed to participate in the project. There was never any intention of this being a Jethro Tull project. In fact, I asked Ian if I should bring along Mark Craney, the drummer I was then rehearsing with for my project. Ian agreed, and the A album was born. The synthesizer slash drums slash bass backing tracks were so fresh sounding. Remember, it was the beginning of a new decade. That Chrysalis Records requested that the album become a new Jethro Tull album. Ian asked me if I was okay with that, and I said I was. As long as I received special guest billing. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Raby goes on to say that Jobson's first impressions of the organization was frugal, but very organized. Okay. And I think that's, I love, I think that's amazing. The organization being what? Like Chrysalis or? The band, I think. The band and the recording studio and the Chrysalis, everything. Yeah, that, that. That sounds that fits so well with what we know about Ian. Those are the adjectives Frugal. I would use for Ian Anderson, yeah. But very organized. <laughs> and and there's also one other thing that I think is interesting. The author asks, 
Jobson what his impression of the other tall musicians were, what his impression was of the other tall musicians because... Tall musicians, but... Sure, 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 of the band at this time. And because this is the only tall album that that Jobson ever worked on, Mm -hmm. and so he really has a unique perspective. Mm -hmm. The members of Tull are some of the nicest people in the business and remain sincerely friendly to this day. He asks about the relationship between Anderson and Martin Barr. Okay. To, and to describe their relationship, he says, symbiotic. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, too. Boy, Eddie Jobson is very, like, surgical in his descriptions and his word choice. Yeah. Everything that he says through the synthesizer, he declines to say as with his human voice. That's it, yeah. <laughs> so the that's interesting. I don't know if it was last week. Or it was a couple of one of the past episodes we talked about uh, how Mark Craney got pulled in. I thought it was Dave Pegg, but it was it was clearly Eddie Jobson. Right, right, right. So with all that being said, Uh Nick, what is the the song to which we have the pleasure of listening today? The song of the day is the final track off of side A is a four. It is black. Sunday, Black Sunday. It is its working title was One Day Too Soon. It was recorded between May 18th and the 21st at oh. at Pop Please with the Maison Rouge Mobile Studio, obviously. Take four was our master here. This song, this is one of my favorite little tidbits about the whole album. This song never stayed on set lists for terribly long. It was never really played live a whole lot because it's okay. so damn hard to sing. It's just too fast in a concert setting to sing. Yeah. It's also very complex as, as we'll hear. Yeah. And that just, that just tickles me. That's all. I just think it's very funny. So without further ado, La Os Lite. Let's, let's have a listen in Norwegian. In Nor- Why Norwegian? Just because? For our Norwegian listeners, Nick. Oh, because we have a, a, a strong contingent of Norwegian listeners. Yeah. We do. It's just because that they laugh when we try to pronounce Norwegian things. Is that it? That's why I do That's it. That's it, yeah. <laughs> so, without further ado, let's have a listen. <laughs> let's listen to Black Sunday. Nick McGill. Omen Sade. That was Black Sunday, the song by Jethro Tull. Do you know how long this song is? I'm going to... No, not offhand. I'm going to guess it's around five minutes. Six and a half. Yeah, wow. Okay. It does not feel that long. No, it it really... I think that it it moves (laughs) along. Yeah, it really does. It powers. So this... Nick, this this is a pretty complex work here. I would, I think that is a safe assessment. Yeah. I would almost, I would almost use the O word to describe this song. Uh, oh, let me guess what the O word is. Is it omnipresent? <laughs> also that. Okay. Okay. Is it? <laughs> Two more guesses. Obfuscating. Oh, I, I felt a little obfuscated about okay. it at first. Okay. Yes. But that wasn't what I was thinking. Is it? obstructive i definitely i think that it is but no that wasn't the word that i was thinking i don't know i have forgotten the word uh, no it's taken no this bit has taken so long <laughs> i'll never i won't i won't sleep tonight <laughs> no i think i was gonna i was gonna propose describing it as an oeuvre oh 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 you know that i i initially thought that but generally an oeuvre is like a full body of work is it not it could be, but I also think that an individual song at a certain level could attain the status of an oeuvre in our in our completely arbitrary system. <laughs> if it's if it is complex and meaty, and we feel meaty like enough, it. and we feel like it, and guess what? It's complex, it's meaty, and by gummy, I feel like it. And these hips don't lie. Those hips don't lie. Everything else about you does, but the hips, I can trust. Not the hips. That's what always gets me in trouble. I can trust. That's what they say. Those those uh, those plaid skirts that you wear, buddy. I'm telling you. You gotta choose your wardrobe. 
I'm, Nick, I'm sorry. Was that um, was that victim blaming? I apologize. But, <laughs> no. Maybe I don't know. No, I I just I look good in plaid. What can I say? I, you do. You do. What are your feelings about this song? Is this a song that you um that gets your that gets your jam flowing out of the jar? <laughs> Heats the jam so the pectin loosens. <laughs> does this does this tap with the meat of the hand on the bottom of the jar? It my my ketchup stick a knife down into the into the jar and wiggle it around to get the last little bit out. My ketchup flows readily with this song. It's a rocker. It rips. Yeah. It's very it's it's infectiously rocking. You know, it's hard not to get swept into this song. Yes, 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 yes. It's got a strong undertow. And I think this is one of those rare instances where when the pace of a song is so frenetic with tall songs. Mm. Normally, it starts out like right at that pace, and you're 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 swept up, and you never catch up. This one's different. This one does have a fade in with some synthy and flute and and here and there, and it brings us into that that pacing, holding our hand. So you're never felt. You never, you never quite feel like, really oh my gosh, I'm trying to catch up. Yeah. But I think to juxtapose that, Ian's singing is so fast. You never quite process it until it's too late. So you still get that that kind of swept away feeling with the 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 singing. Yes, yes, that's interesting. But I love I love what you're saying about the fact that it kind of it 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 accompanies you. It it brings you in to a. a a place, a starting place that you can actually grab a hold of what's going on musically. Yeah. And then it just keeps going wilder and wilder and wilder and wilder. It's like, you know, it's like one of those rides where you're like, oh, this is fine. This is great. Yeah. Oh, how nice. Yeah. Oh, it's a bit faster. Okay. And then at a certain point, you're like, ah, yeah. How did we get here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Totally. It's the apocryphal of frog in boiling water, you know, before you... it's too late by the time you realize that you've been, you've been boiled up. Boiled. Yes. yes. And I agree about Ian's lyrics that they are so fast and his wordplay is, you know, uh, of course, so complex. Yeah. I, I have never really... I'm now maybe just at the beginning of my journey to understand this song. I've always processed this song emotionally, but never had any kind of intellectual understanding of it. Yeah. Yeah. You need, you need many listens while reading the lyrics to, I think, to fully grasp it. Yes. And even that didn't really do it for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I found a, a key. You found a key. Is it a quote from Ian? It's a quote from Ian. Yeah. yeah, luckily I have one of those too, so. Thank God. Yeah, right, right. But but musically, let's talk music before we get into meaning, right? Okay, yes, yes. So musically, this is described as one of the most, here, I actually have a quote about that too. In this book, A Passion Play, the author describes Black Sunday as, as rivaling anything Tull have ever recorded. In terms of what? In terms of its rivalness. I think in terms of its complexity and its its composition. Sure. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's super crazy complex. Yeah. And apparently this song in particular was also plagued by some technical difficulties, which is probably why Ooh. it took that many days to record. Yeah. Rather than what we typically see, you know, it's like it was recorded between 6 p.m. and 6.05 p.m. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it took, took one single take. Generally, if it takes five takes, like, what was it? The one we just did yesterday. Uh, last week, rather, working, working John, John, working Joe, Joe was was the fifth take, but it was still done on the same day. Oh yeah, so interesting to note, and I think that you know the complexity that we hear come across speaks to that. Yeah, I think so. So musically, we have this incredible, eerie intro of those. I think it might be the bass oh, plucking on a very very low note. Interesting, or it might be a synthesizer set on a very thumpy setting. Yeah. It's crazy, Cynthia. That whole intro is as if leading up to this point hadn't been 80s Cynthia. This is even more 80s Cynthia. Yes, it is. And, but before we get to the synth, before the synth really jams in there, we do have that kind of. Yes. Yeah. That 16th note going in. We have the guitar coming in. Mm hmm. To 
to to kind of set the mood. All of that is before the winner well. Yeah. Yeah, but the synth But there's Oh that's right. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. The synth intro gave me a flashback to being a child and watching the labyrinth. Oh yeah. We just Rook just watched the labyrinth the other day. Yeah. And it's of that era, so it has yeah. all that really synthy sound in it. And I was just like, ah, oh, yeah, David Bowie's Godpiece. Ray and I actually just watched Legend last night too. It is a classic, and it's ta- Tangerine Dream for the U.S. version did the 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 soundtrack for that. And it's also like electronic and ambient and synthy, so it's it's the same it's the same feel. Fun fact about the film Legend. Go on. That is the film to which I lost my virginity. Mm. I was going to make that joke. Sometimes reality is better than fiction. Did you ever find it again? <laughs> no. No, I haven't watched the film again. <laughs> Stuck somewhere in the second row. Oh, is that what that was? I saw. <laughs> Oof. Saw a smudge. Yeah, that, that was no tangerine dream. Oh. Nick. So then we have this, we have the, after the synth coming in with this super strong building all these layers at the mm-hmm. same time. Mm-hmm. I imagine that took, a, I imagine that is part of what took a long time is putting all those layers together. Sure. Yeah. We then have this spicy change. Oh, oh, the words that I wrote before we get into spicy change, those, those yes. synth stings that you were talking about that. Went away. I don't have you ever listened to Sticks? Do you know much of Sticks? I have listened to Sticks. I'm not a I'm not a um I've picked up a lot of Sticks, but I, I'm not a stick expert. I I listened to the hell out of Sticks in high school, and that's a huh. super sticks sound to me. That oh, that like broad, sweeping, really piercing synth is right. is very sticks. That's all. Sorry, continue. Spicy, spicy release or or whatever. Spicy change in which we get the actual piano sound. Yeah, how nice is that? How refreshing. It's very sorbet. It's very clean to the palate compared to everything else that's so that kind of bleeds here and there. The piano is so crisp in this. Sorbet is actually the dessert that I was covered in when I lost my virginity. <laughs> uh, but then the drums come in really distinctly. We have a wonderful drumming. Mm-hmm. The flute comes in. I yeah. mean, this is really, you know, we used to, in previous albums, we've talked about the 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 tall layer. Yeah, it's. I feel like it's been a while. And there are some things, yeah, there are some things in the song that kind of harken back to some earlier Ian sounds or some some earlier tall sounds. Sure. Yeah. What that first verse, I love the fact that we have the voice exposed with just those hard musical hits behind it. Yeah. When Ian starts singing, we the instruments drop out and we just have dump 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 dump. Tomorrow is the one day I would change for a Monday with freezing rains melting and no trains are running and sad eyes passing. Very effective when you've built up for, I mean, I, I, I should have looked to see time-wise where it's coming up, but we've heard at least a minute of music, I think, oh, yes. before Ian comes in. So feeling that that layering and that build and then, boom, it's Ian's voice, so much more effective than throwing Ian's voice and like a change in tempo or a change in sound, whatever. Like, yeah, that works. But pulling back that that, that instrumentation is is very good, very very good. It's the musical equivalent of of walking in a nice calm stream and then tipping over a rock and finding a crayfish underneath that goes. It is that Ian's voice doing that? Yes. Is that, okay, that's Ian's. Voice. Ian's voice is the crayfish. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Sure. Nabs your finger. <laughs> we then have. Oh, so then after the first couple of verses, we have the piano mm-hmm. go on this incredible riff. Yeah. At which point I wrote, Billy Joel, eat your heart out. I mean, just in general, he should. He should. <laughs> just a good rule of thumb. He should, yes. And then we and then we get into some 
you know, some some electric guitar stuff, which gave me kind of pee broke. Oh, cap and yeah. Hand vibes. Super stingy. Yeah. A little thematically related as well here. Yeah, I was I was going to ask if you caught there are two two portions of Martin in here. There's that super broad stingy that kind of that elicits pee broke that kind of matches the the broad sweeps of the synth. There's also like you get some it's kind of way in the back, but you get some some strummy sound as well. That's that feels less processed. Maybe he he flipped a pedal off or something. It could be Ian as well. It could be Ian on an, an acoustic. Yeah, that's true. I, I couldn't. I couldn't quite tell, and I didn't think yeah. to listen for it, it possibly being an acoustic. But there is, there is a second portion of guitar, whoever it is, that is strummy yes. and a little more reserved. Yes, and then we also have Martin's solo toward the the third third of the song, where he he picks up the tune. There's that wonderful moment where the tune passes back and forth between Martin, who's in wonderful form, Ian on the flute. And Ian does some things on the flute in this song in particular that some very specific sounds that we haven't heard in a, in a little while mm. where he does a, a flutter tongue mm-hmm. ascending sequence of notes, which really makes reminds me of the Aqualung sound. Sure. Days. And and there's I don't it's not that I hear him breathing, but you can you can hear the force behind. Yes. The yes, note, yes. You know, I feel like we haven't heard that in a while, too. This is this is a very as perfectly structured and and built and created as it is there are some aspects that are kind of raw and it's nice mostly the, yeah. the aspects that ian brings in whether it's the singing or the flute i agree also when you take a song to this tempo and do things so complex as are happening in this song i think that kind of pushes the musicians to the the clo- you know closer to the edge of their limit right one of the things that stands out to me is listening to the to david Pegg play 16th notes on the bass which is not something that you hear yeah. very often for bassists because it's really hard <laughs> I did not catch it until the second half of it, but I I did catch it, and he is just he's all over the place. It's it's great harmony. It works. He's not playing the same notes, but he's like I think he's up the octave a little bit or something. But it's it's, it's very intense. It's cool. It's very very cool sound. A bucket of ice water next to him, who he, he can dip his hand into. Yeah, pss, it sizzles when he puts it in there. Yeah, <laughs> it's a bucket of chilled holy water it's it's actually a bucket of crayfish that they then <laughs> consume after the fact that he dumps onto the base that's and it. that's how he achieves that sound yeah yeah <laughs> uh i get why he cannot sing this in concert present day obviously but even back then with how much he moved you know even with a slow song and he's bopping around like he's he's got to be to the limit of his of his his lung capacity but yeah it reminds me of those romantic composers who would compose things that almost no one could play including themselves yeah 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 cuz they would write it they would write it right. the way it is and they can hear it in their mind and they think yeah this would be amazing to do and then and then it's the one human, of those the human mind can go beyond <laughs> the limits of the human body yeah it's like this would sound amazing if anyone could play it. <laughs> if I had eight arms <laughs> and they had invented methamphetamine. I wonder if anyone has taken those those like quote unquote impossible pieces and, and then produced them electronically, you know, so you could choose. Well, I think that that, you know, human capacity has has mm. caught up with some of those compositions. OK, fair enough. Uh, it's it's because of the methamphetamine. I was going to say it's all the meth. Yeah. Speaking of meth, Nick, shall we talk about the lyrics? Yeah, I just want to say I really like once the lyrics end and the rest is just instrumental. I really like that musical exit that kind of I do, too. It's it's nice. 
I like how at the end we have that tuned up yeah. ending where it goes pretty fast almost until the very end. And then you just have that that raise, that rising, that effect that raises all the tones that you hear. And so it just sort of like ascends into the air like a like a very eager helium <sighs> balloon. See, your problem is you set the bar too high and you set yourself up to have to do five analogies an episode. <laughs> I go for one. One analogy is fine. I, I do. I do like to set myself up for for disappointment. Yeah. Here. <laughs> been doing it for twenty plus years. I've been talking to my therapist about it, and him. they can't help me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nick, shall we talk about the yeah. lyrics? And specifically, I want to talk about all the things that I thought this song was oh, about before I good found idea. out what it okay. was about. Okay. Yes. Okay. So. The term, and I think that I think that part of my confusion with this song is that the term Black Sunday is, I think, a bit of a red herring, a black herring, if you will. Because it is a term. It is a term. Yeah. It is a term that refers to several dozen events throughout history. All coincidentally falling on Sunday and all kind of not great. Yeah. There was a, it could refer to a major bushfire in Victoria, Australia in 1925. It could refer to the 1935 dust storm that w- that destroyed part of the Midwest in the U.S. It could refer to another series of bushfires. It could refer to the 1967 Iowa-Minnesota tornado outbreak. It could equally refer to any number of war and terrorism acts. Or it could even refer to the opening of Disneyland Park, which happened on a Sunday and was a huge z- disaster in 1955. Oh, was it really? Yep. It could refer to the victory of the Los Angeles Raiders in the 1984 Super Bowl. It could refer to the 2001 death of Dale Earnhardt, the famous American race car driver. I also thought that it might refer to what is usually re- called Bloody Sunday, yeah. which is when... In Northern Ireland, uh, a bunch of activists, peaceful protesting activists, were gunned down by British military paratroopers. I think this is probably the one song that you and I have discussed from this era, most likely, because mm. I, I, I had that in my mind, too. And I think it must have been because we had a discussion about it. Maybe it could be. There's also a 1960... 1960- Italian horror film called Black Sunday. Oh. There's also a novel, a 1975 novel by Thomas Harris, who wrote the oh, the Silence of the Lamb books. Yeah, the the, the Hannibal Lecter series. The Hannibal Lecter series. Yeah. This is one of his non Hannibal Lecter books. So I always thought, so kind of like with with that consciousness of like what Black Sunday usually refers to, mm-hmm. I always assumed that this referred to some kind of huge stock market crash. Oh, which doesn't make any sense yeah. because the stock markets aren't open on a no. Sunday. Okay. Or, or even some kind of like, I forget what it's called, but there's a science fiction story about the day, oh, the day the earth stood, stood still. Yeah. When everything stops working and planes fall out of the sky and all that. Huh. Okay. I almost, I thought that maybe it referred to, that it was that kind of a story. It is none of those things. Not, not a one, not a one. I think when we finally reveal the mystery of what this song is actually about, I think we have reason to not have ever thought that because of the sound and the pace and the freneticism of the song. Yeah, it, there for me, this is a song where the content and the sound is slightly mismatched. Like, the sound sounds like some kind of earth-shattering disaster. I, you put crossfire with this sound, I wouldn't have blinked. Right. Totally. Yeah. Totally. So, shall I read a little quote from Mr. Ian Anderson? Please do. What does he say about Black Sunday? Several of the songs dealt with things to do with current scenarios, happenings within the world. Relationships took a back seat. Black Sunday, one of the strongest tracks on the album, suffered from some technical difficulties, unfortunately, and much effort was spent working on that in the mixing process. It's probably my favorite on the album. It was a boy-girl song, the breaking up of a relationship. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a, and not only that, it's a returning home song too. Which, Much not unlike P Broke. Right. Yeah. Good point. Good point. See, I when I think of returning home songs, I forget about P Broke. I think of home, and I don't know. There's like a, one other one that's sweet. That's that's very like romantic. You know. Damn. Yeah, I know. There's one other. And I'm sh- something about smile. You're smiling. You're asleep. Smiling. I'm gonna come home, and there's the garden. Mist sun. Something. <laughs> That's home. Eh. That's home, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I'm. I'm sure we'll get plenty of of Discord comments on this. But so we are accustomed to a going home song, as rare as they are, to be on the sweeter side, rom- yes. on the romantic side. This one is a little spicy. This one is spicy. This one is clearly not. And Ian finally expressing his emotions, like really putting in a personal feeling on this. This is more of him. A fictional, uh, a fictional account. Yeah, exactly. You know, though, I like that that you brought up the alternate title being One Day Too Soon. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. there is something very, well, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but very romantic noir. <laughs> ro- ro- romance noir. Soap opera-y. About this notion of like, oh, if only it had been one day, you know, like, oh, this thing in my life happened one day too soon. And because of that, the relationship fell apart. I just missed it. Yeah. But I love but I love that as a theme. Like, you know, he the story kind of is this this long, almost Jules Vernian description (laughs) of travel. Yeah, it's it's one, two, three, four, four paragraphs for verses of the travel before he even gets home. Right. Yeah. And interesting, you know, a lot of details, this sense that he's rushing, the singer is rushing home in a, in a mad dash in a mad fury going through the airport. I love the details of the, the two paperback novels chosen at random Mm. from the airport store. There's nobody there who can, he can give your money to. Yeah. I, and that to me is, that's a very Ian, that's like a little, a little do- dollop of uh, frothed Ian milk. Yeah, it's a, some actual reality thrown in here to make it more believable. Right. It's like oh, I can't, yeah. I can't possibly fly without a couple of novels. I'll just grab these two. And so I'm in a rush. The the whole that whole like real serious like step by step description. N- nothing seems to be working for him. Like he's really setting it up for her. And it could go either way, I suppose. It could be disaster after disaster after disaster. And then I'm finally home. Sure. A little bit like To Cry You a Song. Yeah. And I'm finally here. I didn't bring any cigarettes, but I'm here in your arms for the next 13 hours. But this one is is the other side of that. Is, is Actually, fun fact, it took me 13 hours, 13 to, hours lose to lose my virginity. your virginity. Yeah. You held on so hard. You fought it. You fought it, Omen. You put up. But the finally, good I had fight, to take my clothes but off. But you finally, <laughs> she's just pulling a thread of your pants until they just just disintegrated. So then we get the we get the homecoming, and uh-huh. we have the the verse where finally we get to understand what's what's going on at the back of the house. There's a gray sky, a tumbling. Milk bottles piling on doorsteps a crumbling. Back of the house, there's a gray sky a tumbling. Milk bottles piling on doorsteps a crumbling. So there's this sense that he's coming home, but home has been abandoned. Yeah. Which leads me to think, like, how is this only a day too soon? Or or a day too late in in, in this sense? If If stuff's falling apart and the milk bottles are there... Well, I think that I think that when we get to note paper scribbles, I read unbelieving, saying how sorry, how sad was the leaving one day too soon. Note paper scribbles, I read unbelieving, saying how sorry, how sad was the leaving one day too soon. I get the impression that that his leaving home one day too soon mm. was. Okay. Was the cause of what has caused this, you know, his lover to leave him. So if he had stayed one more day, see, I was interpreting it as he got home, he got home too late. If he had gotten there Saturday instead of Sunday, if he had been there a day too soon, but you're right, it's leaving one day too soon. 
So I, th- I think you're right. I think it's, I think that was the final straw. But it's also, but it's also not, it's, uh, I think you, ha- there's a reason you think that because there are lines like impatient feet tapping and cigarette burning homecoming one day too soon. Impatient feet tapping and cigarette burning homecoming one day too soon. Too soon. Maybe to him, it's, it's, he was late by one day and maybe to his wife, girlfriend, whatever it was, he had left too early, you know, that the time or he was coming home one day too late. And, you know, and that was, it's, it's the, it's the, it's the one day, not in the right direction. Yeah. So in, in some direction, they, they, there are ships passing in the night and it's, it's just a matter of he's, he's made clear his priorities and it seems like the time that he has spent with this person has slowly diminished over the life of the relationship and whatever he's doing, whether he's a touring musician or, right, or, right. or a businessman or, or whatever, that that those choices that he's made to do that have caused this erosion. And perhaps it's even, you know, that that whatever he's off doing, he has to sacrifice one day too soon in order to go home. Yeah. You you know, maybe I think my difficulty with the song, Nick, is that I think it sounds so amazing. I think the lyrics are so beautiful, but I feel like the central theme of One Day Too Soon is isn't set up in the most clear way. Yeah. But is that okay though? You know, like is the vagary does it really make it what it is? If we knew for a fact would it would we lose something cuz we're well at this point well, we don't whether we think it's okay or not yeah. does it get a change yeah i mean the, valid the, Comple- the recording of the song completely valid but ian ian is is known for his illusion at best you know it's right. it's super rare that we get that this is this is how it is this is what it is and this is what's happening you know, it's it's Michael Collins, Jeffrey and me is is pretty clear. Crossfire's pretty clear, but they never actually say any names or any any specific events, right? I mean, he he gets pretty precise into details, but if you don't know of that event, like we didn't when we started, we don't right. we don't know what it is. We know Michael Collins is an actual human being and we can figure out from there. Yes. I think that emotionally what I get from this song is a day late and a dollar short. Yes. You know, that all this effort of the first four stanzas, all of this, you know, soul crushing travel, and he's still a day late emotionally, whatever that means. Right, right. And and maybe that's that those, maybe those four stanzas are the four years of that relationship that they've put into Interesting. You know, I mean, because it feels like there's, I mean, she stuck around for a while, it feels like. I I also wonder that, you know, if if something being one day too soon is less literal and more emotional. That like, oh, if if she had only held out a little longer, I would have come home and, you know, be this reformed person or whatever. I, I had a plan to save the relationship. Right. If, if. If we're interpreting it as she left on Saturday and he got home on Sunday. If indeed it's a she, there's no mention of gender that's, in this song. That's true. Ian is is open and and embracing of all. They. Indeed. They. Whenever they if we assume that the that they left not not the day after he left, but the day before he came home. Returned. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Ooh, yeah, yeah. And is is Sunday a Sunday's a day that like I mean let's let's look at the top. Oh, it's the second one where there's nobody to to buy the paperback. Is there just nobody there on a Sunday? So so if he were there on right. Monday, he'd be able to pay for the book. The next verse, everybody's like standing around in holiday clothing. If if he was there on a Monday, people wouldn't be standing around. Right. That's interesting. You know, so every step of the way is, is oh, one day too soon. But that makes it sound like 
he would be better for everything if he went on Monday instead of Sunday. But I think that's sort of the oh. point. I think maybe that's I think maybe we're getting there. And that's that's that like the whole th- point of this song is that emotions, the heart cannot be put on a calendar. The human heart doesn't care if it's Sunday or Monday. The human heart has demands. And even though it would be much more convenient to wait till Monday in order to travel home and break yeah. up. <laughs> you have yeah, to travel well, right. on this horrible Sunday travel day. And so so Sunday is terrible regardless, because if he had been Saturday, everything would have worked out. If he had been Monday, not everything would have worked out. But, it's, but at least he would have been able to buy his paperback. Exactly, right. So it's one side of things is, no, I get, no, I thought I had something. Even when we it. know what the song is about, it's still a Gordian knot. Right, because he, he gives us the structure, you know, it's like a tanagram. You know, do you remember tanagrams? It's like the, the blocks oh, that have, she, yes. it's like a tanagram. I hated those things. So you, he gives us the outline. Right. But and these you have are. to figure out the, how the shapes fit exactly. into it. Exactly. they never do. They never do. You have to break a corner off and they don't like <laughs> it when you do that. <laughs> the special. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it, breaking the corner off. You're teetering on the line of going to the like advanced learning class or losing or, a grade or <laughs> being held back. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, oh, yeah. That's funny. A little, little too close to home there. <laughs> Just one one final note that I have, specifically looking at the Google lyrics, the first line of the second verse, the taxi that takes me will be moving too quickly mm-hmm. in the song. And in silent singing, he says so quickly. Makes no difference at all. It just it just caught me when I was listening and I, I heard him say so, saw that they had written to. That's all. We will write a strongly worded letter to Google.com. Yeah. And in fact, they already have received our letter because they live inside our homes. That's it. They've heard the entire thing. They are our they're our best listener. They're a big brother, is what they are. <laughs> Nick Omen. Have we the pleasure of listening to next week another song by Jethro Tull? In fact, we do. Don't say. What will song will what song will we be talking tell about next week, Nick? With our mouth sounds. The we are on to side B, the second side of the album. So we are on B1. Track is Protect and Survive. Uh-huh. In the meantime, take out all of the pants, shirts, and kisses from your suitcase. And all you got to do is put in five stars. That's carry on. You'll It'll fit. It's that great. That is carry on. It'll fit underneath the seat in front of you. Fly on over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Give us those five stars. Give us a rating and a review. Tell everyone how much of a nerd you are and how much of a nerd we are. You may not always be able to find the salesperson to take your hard-earned cash for those softback novels, but you will always be able to write in to us because we never sleep. Send us your jump starts. Send us your tales from the tull. Send us your complaints. Send us your approbations. Send us your probation officer. It's been a while since we asked for those. You can find us at momes at fecklessmomes.com or you can head on over to fecklessmomes.com and there's a contact us form right on the home page. While you're doing that, get your passport and get your credit card. More importantly, buy some Talk Tall to Me merch and sign up for a Patreon. Until next week, while you are doing all of those things... I am the sad eyes passing in Windows flimsy, Nick McGill. I am the cold water plumbing, Omen said. We are the pile of milk bottles, the feckless moms. And this is the 1918 attack of the SMU-151 against the U.S. ships off the coast of New Jersey. Talk tell to me. All right.
right, everybody, shut up and sit down. Sit down. Tommy. <clears throat> Tommy. Tommy. Yeah. S- this boss. Sit down. Um, sit down. Okay, I'm sitting now. I'm All sitting. Right. Thank you. Tell me, what do you got for a story? What's the lead? Oh. We, we got to get this paper out in less than three hours. Give it to me. We got to well, sell we just, papers. Yeah, we all, we, we just got a report from, uh, from Hump Tulips, Washington about, a about a, a big flood in the, in the tobacco factory. They've got cigarettes floating around everywhere and, and it's poisoned, it's poisoned the well water. People are, people, people are going crazy and dying over there and. Washington. Amazing. That'll sell. That'll sell. We'll call that, um, we'll call that, uh, Amaranth Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, oh, let's I love go it. with that. Let's I love go it. with that. All right. Um, uh, Jasper, what do you got? Jasper, give me something good, buddy. Uh, boss, we got, uh, we got an earthquake over in Booger Hole, Booger Hole, Washington. Okay. Booger Hole, it's, it's not far actually down the okay. road from Hump Tulips. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we had an earth, we had an earthquake over there and, uh, and a, a bus full of nuns. Uh, went into the hole and uh, and they're still down there. We don't know. We're, we're feeding. They're, they're lowering down uh, sacred wafers to them. We don't know how long they'll last. Oh, that that'll fly off of the shelves. We'll call that a, 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 a Vermilion Saturday. Oh, I love it, boss. I love Amazing. it. Amazing. All right, uh, Francis. Francis, if you do not give me a good story, you are out on your ass. I'm sick of your puff pieces. <laughs> give me something good. Well, I. I was going to tell you about the opening of the candy factory, but I, I guess I'll tell you that in Mosquitoville, Florida, there's been a there's been another oil spill, and um, oh, yeah. uh, it was right next to a zoo, Perfect. and uh, and also it was next to a, a baby food manufacturing plant, oh. and so now all the baby food is covered with oil. Amazing. And, and the tigers are very oily. Amazing. Gamboge Wednesday. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Love My it. My career is going in a direction I don't prefer. All right, uh, Monica. Monica, you are my... You get the dirt, give it to me. I know you've got something good. Front page headline, give it to me, Monica. Yes, boss. I, I just came back from Sheboygan, and they had a very unusual tropical cyclone in Sheboygan right at the same time that their mayoral campaign was discovered to be run entirely by hairless monkeys. And also the... Um, the, the entire police force of Sheboygan is discovered to have been uh, raised and brazed on crack cocaine. <laughs> it's an amazing triple triple story here, boss. I really think it's going to get everyone interested in Sheboygan again. Monica, you have attained perfection. We'll call it, uh, oh, we'll call it Burleywood Thursday. I'm just going to go get a cup of coffee. <laughs> And finally... I've got feelings, boss! Jasper, sit it out. Finally, Maxwell, you are the boss's son. You could literally, literally poop on this desk and you would get praised for it. (sighs) Maxwell, what do you have? Um, hey, Dad. Uh, I was looking at my phone Twitter... And it looks like uh, reports are coming in from Toadsuck, Arkansas, Frankenstein, Missouri, Why Not, North Carolina, Boring, Oregon, and Accident, Maryland, that there's, a, there's an exciting new uh, news program about, about rock and roll. Oh, rock and roll. The kids are into that these days, right? They sure is. All right, tell me about it, Maxwell. You're actually contributing something this time. Uh, well, I think we could put it on big, splashy, frontline head newspapers, newspaper headlines, and we'll, the, the headline will say, Talk tall to me. Is it or is it not a proud member of the Feckless Moms Audio Network? Sold. Raise, you take my job. I'm going to retire. I forgot to wear pants. Fun fact, I was... I was wearing pants when I lost my virginity. Wow. Complex. Yeah. Best five seconds of my life. <laughs>